I am an astrophysicist, and I search for alien life. I am one of those who believe, with a great passion, that there is more out there than we can ever imagine. When I was a child, I would run across a big yard in late in the evening, in winter nights after my music classes, and I would see the same stars on the sky every winter night. I was puzzled. This must mean something. But nobody else cared. Nobody even noticed this elephant in the room. And at that time, we didn't have internet or smartphones to learn it immediately. So it took me some time to find it in books. That was Orion constellation, and it's still my favorite because that was the first puzzle I have solved in the sky. Here's my message to the young people: If you stumble on something puzzling and nobody cares about it, go for it. <laughs> This is where you can change people's mind. This is where you discover your own universe. And I will talk today about my universe. This universe is vast. There are 200 billion stars in the Milky Way galaxy, and there are 200 billion galaxies in the universe. 200 billion times 200 billion is the number with how many zeros? 22 zeros. This is a horribly large number, hard to imagine. Let's call it Harillion. So there is four Harillion stars in the universe, and the sun is just one of them. And almost every star has a planet, so there is at least one Harillion planet out there in the universe. And the Earth is just one of them. In this universe, we are really tiny. When on the Maui beach, enjoying your sunshine, take a piece of grain, a grain of sand, and imagine this is the Earth, so tiny and so fragile. Then in this scale, the sun will be the size of a grapefruit, and it will be only 15 meters away. And the nearest star to the sun, Proxima Centauri, will be the size of a walnut, and 4,000 miles away, somewhere in Los Angeles. <laughs> Let's find it. The light from the most distant galaxy would travel to us 13 billion years. We were not there at that time. This would be equivalent to eight horillion miles in distance. So these three numbers, which I want you to learn today, very simple. It's one Harillion planet, two, uh, four Harillion stars, and eight Harillion miles of darkness. One, four, and eight, and 22 zeros. How can we imagine to find life in this vast universe when we are so tiny. Think about finding diamond on the beach, on the same beach where you pick up the sand of gra a grain of sand. That's impossible. Finding life in the universe would be even harder. First, because of us distances, as we learn, and the second, because we don't know what we're looking for. Alien life can be so much different from us, completely beyond, of, beyond our imagination. We have to be extraordinary thinkers who passionately follow their dreams despite extraordinary circumstances. It was kind of unusual, but still very competitive, to become an astronomer for me. And Even worse, when my country collapsed, the Soviet Union, then I was faced with survival during the economical crisis. But at the same time, I didn't want to miss any events which happened in my lifetime in the universe. So 
I would run telescope during any time we had electricity. And I would consider myself very lucky if there were no clouds. Then I would run back to stand in line for food in order to support my family. I lived two lives. On one side, I wanted to keep my passion for science alive. And on the other side, I needed to keep my family alive. Then I realized that in order to continue my research, I have to move on. I moved in Russia, from Volgograd to St. Petersburg, then to Crimea in Ukraine, then I worked in Oslo, Finland, then in uh, Zurich, Switzerland, Freiburg, Germany, and here on Maui, USA. Thank you. <laughs> I learned new languages, new cultures, new accents, which is a mixture, and new political systems as well. I became an alien, a foreigner in these countries. But I left peace of my heart in every city I lived for so many years. Finding extraterrestrial life is not easy. And we learn from our personal experience. In these countries, I got multiple cultural shocks as well. In Finland, it would be very offensive, offending to refuse to taste a soup made of freshly squeezed blood of reindeer. That was a cultural, uh, uh, local tradition, and it's, you have to try it. <laughs> In Switzerland, I have learned to value time. You know, these Rolex watches, they value time. And I, w I learned to value every minute of my life and of life of other people. In Germany, I became a female alien among my male physics professors, colleague, and so on. Such diverse experiences gave me advantage of seeing the world with different eyes seeing our tiny, fuzzy world through the eyes of the universe. It taught me also tolerance and respect for others who can be different. This is what we have to apply in research as well. We have to become, again, encyclopedic scientists as Archimedes, philosophers like Giordano Brunner, and adventurers like early Hawaiians, in order to find and recognize the life in the universe, which can be so much different from us. And I learn, if I push beyond every limit what I have, I can do the impossible. But why we should care about that? Why should we find that other Earth and make sure that there is life on it? Why do I care? Why should you care? This is very easy. We are curious. We are curious creatures. And we all want to know, want to see that green man, don't we? <laughs> you want to say it, I also want to say it. I haven't. And in the end of the day, it's not about them, it's about us. When we discover alien life, we will find out who we are, humans, our terrestrial life, where we come from, and what is our destiny and future. This is definitely a mixed endeavor. All human history is about us, is about us being special, being unique, being extraordinary. We compare ourselves to other forms of life and believe we are the kings of the nature. We put Earth in the center of the universe. Then the, we realize something wrong with it, so we put the sun in the center of the universe. Again, it was a little mixed. We put Milky Way in the center of the universe. Not so bad. And we found out in the end that there is no 
center of the universe. <laughs> the universe expands at every point of the space and time. It expands everywhere, also in this room, and also inside our bodies. And when we eat french fries, it expands even faster. <laughs> Finding alien life would be just another way to disprove that we're special. Why do we want to do this to ourselves? Why do we want to risk this self-depreciation? We're so stubborn to hold on this idea. We are so special. Didn't we hear this from psychologists? I am special. We are special. Everyone is special. So why do we want to do this to ourselves? Well, when we find life, we will find out that we are inhabitants of the universe. Our planet is just a single blue dot among billions of other stars and billions of other planets. To get to that point in the history, we have to be extraordinary thinkers. We have to develop smart eyes which can, with which we can see life and the civilization in the universe. Our first step towards finding life on other planets is to detect atmospheres of these planets. And we, my team was the first to see this visible light from one of the distant planets beyond the solar system. We worked for two years and collected data for 100 nights in order to detect this light. This planet orbits an orange star, and this was against every expectation that the planet has to be kind of reddish of a Jupiter color. It actually happened to be blue. It's not as blue as Earth, but more like Neptune. So when we detect atmospheres of these planets, we look for composition. And if we find oxygen, methane, and water vapor in large amounts of these atmospheres, we will mark this planet as a candidate for the life similar to us. Our second hope is photosynthesis. The universe, we believe that photosynthesis will be everywhere in the universe. Bacteria, plants on our planet use sunlight for their, as an energy source for their growth. Photosynthesis is an important element of the food chain for us. So I study in the lab plants and bacteria and compare them with inorganic samples like sands and rocks in order to be prepared to distinguish planets with life and without life. I work in the lab in Pukalani at the Advanced Research Technology Center. And Hawaii is the perfect place to do this work. Because, of the, because the fresh samples of plants are available all year round, even in winter time, I would usually drive down Kula highway, highway and pick up my samples for the experiment of the day. And I was really excited to see what would be the signal from red hibiscus, what will be the signal from purple bougainville, or green avocado leaves. We use these plants as prototypes of photosynthetic organisms in the universe. And then we build models for alien lives, how they could look. And when we puzzled with this question, how aliens can look like, we actually find answers in the backyard. These planets which I show here, they are populated by Hawaiian plants. So it's this is my artistic nature comes through, and my friend helped me to do that. So our third hope is to find civilizations on other planets. And here we have to be kind of smart as well. So we want to find civilizations without, in a safe way, without revealing ourselves and without communicating with them. 
We, want to, we need to remember that uh, civilizations can be aggressive. We know it in our history. And so we want to avoid contact with them, but still learn about them. Our team proposed a simple technique to find such civilization in a safe way. The idea is very uh, easy. It's based on the fact that when we do anything, every activity generates heat. So when we do exercises, we get hot, so generate heat. When we drive car or run the computer, we generate heat. So our cities are already heat islands and 10 degrees Celsius hotter than natural environment. So these um, heat islands can be seen on other planets independently what aliens do there. Just if they exist and they do something, that's, that's the signature of their activity. We find this heat. To find the life and civilization, we, we need, beyond solar system, we need really large telescopes. One telescope which would give us the best chance to achieve this result is called the Colossus. This uh, 75 meter diameter telescope would be somewhat of a size of a football field. And it was designed uh, within our team. And uh, collective area of its mirrors four times larger than a 30 meter telescope, which will be built on Mauna Kea. But the cost of the Colossus will be the same as one 30 meter telescope. So it's realistic to build it, and it gives us the best chance to detect civilizations and life. When we detect life in other planets, we will understand and learn that we are not alone, and we are not special. But we will learn that the universe is our home. We will learn that we, we are aliens for somebody else who is looking at us. In order to get to this extraordinary event in our lives, we have to have a diversity of ideas. And the diversity is not just declaration of fairness, of political correctness. It affects our own ability to understand the universe. We need billions of smart eyes to contribute to this vision. We need to fuse science with technology, education and design, with art and fiction. And it's my dream that my next project, ET Life Express magazine, will become one in a kind such forum of ideas for everybody who dares to learn uh, the place in the universe. A 60 years old man left a comment on one of our project websites. He said that, I want to see that alien life is detected in my lifetime. I think it's possible, but only when we make a colossal effort, only when we step out of our comfort zone, only when we push beyond every conceivable limit. It's possible. Thank you.